to, uh... well, this is my uh, second visit to Resch. I did it uh, almost 10 years ago uh, in your other campus. Uh, and uh, I spent several days here. I had a good time. Uh, they entertained me, and <laughs> it was fun. So I came back. The reason I came back was I was invited uh, uh, to give a talk at a uh, financial university here as part of a series uh, of Nobel Prize winners that they have. Or I, that was maybe part of the reason why they invited me. Uh, so I thought I would like to see Resch again. Uh, you're a famous school in America. You, are, you may not <laughs> appreciate the extent. I tell people I'm coming to Resch, and they immediately uh, are impressed. So um, I wanted to give actually two talks here, uh, if I may do that. Uh, uh, the first one I've got up here, uh, I'm going to go through a presentation that Maxime Boyko and I gave at the American Economic Association meetings. Uh, and am I doing that? So uh, the uh, American Economic Association, they hear me all right, uh, is uh, the main professional organization of the economists in America. And I had the honor of being president of the association for one year. Uh, it's a rotating honorary title thing. And I also had the obligation to organize the annual meeting of the association. And I had the pleasure of uh, refereeing about 2,500 submissions <laughs> for, for our meetings. But as part of my uh, uh, privileges for doing that, was I could put on some of my own sessions. And uh, I actually put my own paper on the conference. Uh, I was the only guy who didn't have to go through the refereeing process. Uh, but I, I, I asked them, is it all right if I put my own paper on? And they said, well, you're president. <laughs> and it's not democratic here. Uh, they wanted me to do it, they said. So uh, I, I remembered my colleague, Maxime Voiko, from Resch, uh, from years back, uh, who's now uh, visiting Harvard University and Brown University. Uh, so I said, why don't we redo our paper that we did 25 years ago? And I can get it in the journal. <laughs> the, uh, so we, we did this. Uh, so this brings us back to an earlier time when I visited Moscow in 1989. Uh, at this t uh, I'll give you a history of thought for this paper. Um, I, I, there was a conference in 1989 of U.S. and Soviet economists at IMAMO here in Moscow, uh, a, a conference on the American economy. Uh, and they invited uh, uh, Americans as discussants for papers written by Russians about America. Uh, but this was 1989, and actually nobody on either side seemed very interested in papers on the American economy. And we talked a lot with the Russian economists about the Russian economy, which was about to be transformed, as you could see from events, into a more market economy. Uh, I'm getting to this presentation in just a minute. Um, so uh, I had... I found it really interesting to show up in Moscow uh, the first time there's ever been a joint Soviet-American conference and to just chat with r a Russian economists. And what amazed me was that the Russian economists didn't seem different at all in 1989. But another thing that struck me is I found that the Russian economists there were doubtful in 1989 that Russia could make the transition to a market economy. Now, I can't quote anyone exactly. This is my memory from more than uh, 25 uh, years ago uh, that they said, uh, you know, the Russians, they just think the government should take care of it. It's just natural to their way of thinking. And if anyone makes any money, they'll get mad. And they'll think it's unfair. Uh, you can't do business here in Russia. It has to be 
government. I, I'm quoting from memory at a coffee hour uh, in 1989. Uh, and so I asked these Russians then, how do you know that Russians really think differently? Uh, do they really think differently? Are there any studies? And nobody could quote me a study. Uh, so then at that meeting, I met Maxime Boyko, who was a young graduate student, like many of you here <laughs> at the time, at, who was associated with IMAMO. You know what I'm referring to when I say IMAMO. Institut Mirovoy Economiki i Mirjdunarodnih Odnosheni. I'm not sure I said that right, but you, you understand me. Uh, and I said, Maxime, let's write a paper. I, it was kind of a spur of the moment, someone I had just met. Uh, but I thought, uh, first of all, I was impressed by him. Uh, and secondly, I thought, why don't we just find out? This is important. Uh, so I said, let's do uh, some kind of questionnaire surveys. I was into questionnaire surveys. Let's compare Russians with Americans and find out, are they, are they really different? <laughs> if I hold still, I'm all right. I'm not doing anything, and it's... <laughs> um, I'll just keep talking. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm not... I can hold it. I can just do a mic. Can you hear me? I just, is this on? Can you hear me back there? Oh, okay. Can I lift this? Does this still work? Okay, this, okay, this is better. So um, we decided on the spur of the moment to write a joint paper in 1989. Well, it turned out it became 1990. Um, and he gave me instructions. I went back to America, and he gave me instructions about how to collaborate with him uh, on the phone. He said, can you get up at 3 AM? Because he's, this is what he told me from my memory. There's only 40 uh, long distance lines between the USA and the USSR. And they're jammed almost all the time. But if you get up at 3 a.m. New York time, there won't be as many people trying. And so I managed to call him up. And we had long phone conversations about what is really different. How can we do a questionnaire that will establish what is really different about how Russians think and Americans think? Um, so we, uh, on the phone, by the way, the connection, you think your mobile phone is bad. Soviet uh, phones were not terrific in 1989, 1990. But we did it. We, we, we wrote a paper like And what we thought we wanted to do <clears throat> was not ask people about moral values or political slogans, but ask them how they would behave in specific circumstances. And we, we shared stories with each other about, uh, about circumstances. Uh, and. Uh, so we, we've, uh, we wrote a paper It got a lot of attention back then, both in the uh, US and Soviet press. Uh, and we, uh, we published in the American Economic, we were the lead article. This was right, we published it just before the Soviet Union broke apart. So it seemed highly relevant. So we, we were on to something, I think. Uh, that was 25 years ago. Uh, and so I wanted to just, uh, now this is the exact presentation that we gave at the American Economic Association meetings in January of 2015. Uh, but I thought maybe since I'm here, it's now a year old, and it's probably still uh, basically the same. Uh, January of 2016, yeah. Um, exactly 25 years after our first paper. So, uh, well this is what I've more or less said. Uh, so I've said this too. Uh, the conclusion of our paper was contrary to the widespread views, public attitudes toward markets were not an obstacle to development of a market economy. Basically, people are not that different. We failed to find big differences. And it was a surprise. The IMAMO people finally admitted they were surprised, as I remember, by these results. Uh, but no one had made such a comparison before. 
Now, we also later found out that there were other political scientists who probed Soviet attitudes toward democracy. We weren't interested in democracy at that time. But uh, James Gibson and colleagues did a survey in Moscow, also Moscow Oblast, uh, to uh, explore public attitudes towards democracy. But they didn't, they didn't do a comparison with someone else. Uh, they should have. So what we did is we updated uh, some of their questions uh, and compared Moscow and New York um, uh, in, uh, in 2016, 2015. Uh, so, uh, and, and we came uh, anticipating the conclusion Gibson et al. wrote in 1992 is, we have discovered far more support for democratic values in Moscow than we anticipated. So again, it sounds, it, it, sim, the idea that Russians are much more similar than you'd think. Uh, that was an exciting conclusion in 1991 because it meant that maybe there's no problem with Russia becoming a market economy. Uh, but since 1990, uh, 1990, when we did that survey, a lot of things have changed in Russia, as you may know. And so we thought maybe public attitudes have changed. So we, we called up uh, Gibson and his colleagues and asked them for their Russian questionnaire. Now, Boyko and I were very careful with translation. Uh, so uh, we talked a lot about subtleties of wording. But, and we also hired a, a, a professor of Russian at Yale University uh, to read it over very carefully and make sure that there, these things really, these we had Russian version and English versions of the same question. And we, we were very careful to be the same. In, in fact, we excluded questions that we couldn't make the same. Like we had a proposed question about toll roads. Should governments uh, raise the toll on toll highways? And Marxim said, well, they don't have toll roads in the Soviet <laughs> Union. So they won't understand the question. So they just dump that question and do something else. Um, so uh, uh, this is what we presented in the, so I'm sorry if we're uh, making political statements. Uh, I didn't come here to make political statements about Putin, but I'm following through the exact presentation uh, uh, that we wrote for the American Economic Association. Uh, uh, and uh, this is motivating our discussion of uh, democracy. But is it possible that Russians have the same attitudes as Americans toward democracy? Uh, so uh, so uh, we, ha we got the questions in Russian from Gibson et al. And uh, we translated them into English, because he had never done them in English. Uh, and we got identical questionnaires in the two countries. Uh, there were telephone interviews, all of them, except for uh, this one here is, uh, uh, do I have a pointer? Uh, yeah. This is, uh, uh, Gibson et al. did a face-to-face -face home interview. Uh, you, tend, you can see that uh, we got uh, people who were educated in, in both countries uh, who answered the, uh, the age distribution. We got fairly similar age distribution in both surveys. Uh, there, there were mostly locals in both countries. The big change in Russia was that in 1990, only 2% worked for a private business. Uh, and that uh, went up uh, in uh, 2015, dramatically. So, so in fact, I can advance it with this. So here are some of our questions. This is our most famous. We put this right at the beginning of our publication uh, about fairness. So th this is going right at what the Imamo people said to me. Uh, Anna, so the question that he and I divide, he was remarking that there was a holiday in the Soviet Union called International Women's Day, I think. Is that right? I have that right? Uh, and we have what's Mother's Day. It's the same holiday, but with, uh, they had to do it on a different date with a different name. But it's, you buy flowers for your girlfriend or your wife on this date. And he had noticed there were private flower sellers in Moscow who were charging high prices on that date. And some people were angry about it. 
So he thought this, maybe this, someone at Imamo said this, he thought the Russians, see, they don't tolerate raising. Obviously, you should raise prices on a women's day because that's, there's an extra strong demand and it's costly to produce so many flowers on one day. You have to raise prices. So we did this question and we worked this out carefully. Uh, on a holiday, there is a great demand for flowers. Their prices usually go up. Is it fair for flower sellers to raise their prices like this? And you know what? In 1990, there was no difference between the Russians and the Americans. Uh, uh, both, most of them thought it's unfair. Uh, economists don't think that way. We're different. Right? We immediately recognize peak load pricing as a legitimate business strategy. But most, peop most ordinary people just get angry when they see that happening. Uh, the only thing we've highlighted this thing is that the New Yorkers have changed. The Russians haven't changed. This whole market experience never changed this attitude among Russians. But it did. Something happened to the Americans. Uh, they're more, they're more um, uh, capitalist than they were. They're still not very capitalist. Maybe it has something to do with, you've heard of this guy, Donald Trump. Uh, our, our questionnaire went out before him. But this is showing how it's changing values. But not what you think they are. We thought the Russians would change. But it's the Americans who change on this question. But we had different variations. Um, so a small factory produces kitchen tables and sells them at $1,000 each. Demand increases for the tables, uh, but costs haven't changed. So uh, uh, the, the, co the company raises the price of a table. Is this fair? In other words, do you have to justify a price increase with a cost increase? Uh, and again, uh, the, most people in both countries in 1990, uh, they were just almost the same. They, they both think it's unfair. So they're both anti-capitalist and to the same degree. Well, and now again, the only change, in, there's no change virtually in Russia. Um, uh, M15, I said it's Moscow in 2015. And this is Moscow, I'm sorry, I didn't, this is Moscow in 1990. And this is New York in 1990 and New York in 2015. The only thing I see is that the Americans are becoming more capitalist. But still, most of them aren't capitalist. They, most of them think it's unfair. Um, so, um, but then we found this interesting. There's a distinction between thinking something is unfair and thinking that the government should intervene to stop it. So should the government introduce limits on the increase in prices of flowers even if it might produce a shortage of flowers. And this is where we found a difference between the New Yorkers and the Russians in 1990. Uh, in Moscow, most Russians thought the government, this is Soviet Union, by the way, uh, most, uh, most Russians thought that the government should stop it, and Americans didn't. So there is a distinct. So here's a little bit of a difference. Uh, and you, so, uh, well, uh, so uh, the difference, uh, however, now is uh, still, I guess it's still there. It's weakened a little bit. Uh, basically the same. This is, uh, our second paper wasn't as influential as our first because we're basically finding no change. So it didn't, uh, the interesting thing is what we did in 1990, I think. Um, so we, we wondered if uh, Americans pride themselves on being hardworking and entrepreneurial. So are they different from the Russians? In the, so we, we had a, a conceptual question about, uh, would, you, would you take a job that gave you more pay, but you'd have to work longer hours? Uh, and ask, would you take it? Uh, and we found that the Russians were the more ambitious than the Americans in 1990. Uh, but I guess that's no longer true in 2015. Uh, it's kind of hard to see a, a pattern here. Um, uh, so this is another, we thought maybe the Russians were more idealistic through d decades of indoctrination through uh, Soviet government about the importance of uh, class, con what is it, loyalty to your working class and uh, not making money. Isn't that right? Well, we thought so. That's what Soviet Union stood for. Uh, and so we had this question that we worked out painstakingly on the phone. Uh, which do you agree with? You can choose between the, either of 
this statement or this statement. What would you like? To win fortune without fame. You just make a lot of money, okay? And you can live comfortably for the rest of your life. Would you like to do that? Or would you like to be famous but not make a lot of money, like win a medal at the Olympics? So think about it. Which would you rather do? Become a millionaire or win a medal at the Olympics representing your country? Uh, turns out both countries, they want the money. <laughs> they don't want the fame without fortune. Uh, but the Russians were even more wanting the money than the Americans. Uh, so Americans are not money grubbers or anymore, anymore, not more than Russians. Although you could say that basically the two countries are the same because there's not a big difference. Most people in both countries all the time say they want the money. So, oh, now this is one of Gibson's questions uh, about democracy. And, and this, uh, actually, I think Boyko Maxim uh, put bad news. This is the most uh, least optimistic question about Russians on our thing. Uh, so which of these, uh, uh, do you agree with this following statement? This is the percent agree. Uh, because dem uh, reading here, because demonstrations frequently lead to disorder and destruction, radical and extremist political groups should be forbidden to demonstrate. And here we saw this is our major difference between well uh, Russians or the, in 2015. We can't compare Russians with Americans in 1990 because Gibson et al. didn't do that, but we can compare them now, and about twice as many. Uh, uh, Russians agree uh, 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 that uh, I, I don't know what this might re it might be it might be spurious if there was what happened right was there anything in the news around that time that might have made Russians uh, feel more strongly but on these other questions society shouldn't have to put up with people whose political views are different from the views of the majority uh, nobody agrees with it in either country. Uh, and uh, uh, well, here's an, but here's another uh, difference between Russia and America. It is better to live in a society with strict order than to allow people so much freedom that they can bring destruction to society. And uh, many more Russians agreed with that than Americans. In now, again, it might also be that we didn't. We need more research on this, but we're not getting a big response on this research this time. We got a big response in 1991. Uh, but not this time. But it strikes me as, is this real? Um, uh, uh, because when I read this question myself, I, this is this not written by me, this is written by the other uh, researchers. Uh, I mean, maybe this is obviously, it, we're, we're talking about destruction to society, of course we don't want to let that happen. So it may be that the wording is somehow uh, confusing. Uh, uh, on the other hand, maybe there is something being revealed, but it's not about democracy. It's about something about fear of disorder, or fear of. Uh, uh, well, I'll stop with that because I don't know fully what this ultimately means. Uh, so, uh, where there's total agreement everywhere, all time, uh, no matter what a person's political beliefs are, he should be provided with the same political rights and defense as anyone else. Nobody. Uh, I mean, only two or three percent or seven percent disagree with that statement. It's up, I think, maybe a little bit because of terrorism recently, but it's not up in Moscow. Uh, uh, it is necessary that everyone, regardless of their views, can express themselves freely. Uh, only a single digit disagreement with that in either country. If someone is suspected of high treason, he should be put to prison without a trial. We were kind of surprised by this, that 18% uh, of uh, uh, Russians would agree you put anyone to prison without a trial. But you know what? It's just the same in America. They have the same, the same opinion. Uh, the, the press should be protected by law uh, from persecution by the government. Uh, again, uh, it's pretty similar in the two countries. So, this is not the way you write a scholarly paper that gets a lot of attention. It's like there's no change through time and there's no difference across countries. Although it is sort of a puzzle. You'd think that, why, why do we get this impression that there's such a difference? So um, our, 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 uh, our 
2015 survey does not find empirical evidence that non-democratic attitudes are prevalent in Russia. You remember, this is written for the American economic. This might sound funny to you, but uh, people talk about democracy in Russia uh, and in America. I, I should add, as president of the American Economic Association, I was able to add sessions to our annual meetings. And I added a whole session on Russia, which is not, not, it hasn't happened in recent years. Uh, and I brought in another paper by Sergei Gureyev and Nikita Melnikov. Uh, do you know these people? They were here at, they, I think they both left Resch. Uh, on, um, uh, on social capital in Russia and analyzing it for different regions of Russia. Maybe you, you look like you remember this. Uh, and then we had an interesting paper by Daniel Treisman, who is a professor at University of California, Los Angeles, on oligarchs in Russia. And uh, the basic summary of his conclusion is that there's a mythology of oligarchs that presents them as opportunists who came to power right after the breakup of the Soviet Union, who took advantage of the disorder and became rich in oil and gas. Uh, but he said this is a myth. His study showed that Russian oligarchs are pretty much like oligarchs anywhere. And it's better to think of this a trend toward inequality in the world and a trend toward big time billionaires. And it's not really that different in Russia. Uh, so I'll stop with that. And I, should, should I, maybe I should go on to my other presentation right away. But, uh, I, yeah, I'll go on. Uh, so uh, did I have, a, I think that's our last slide, yeah. Uh, so I hope I didn't offend anyone. But how could I offend anyone? Unless you prided yourself on as being Russian and being different. You're not different, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, uh, it reminds me of the uh, complaints that people have against school teachers who tell their children that they're all special, when in reality they're all the same, pretty much the same. Uh, so I, I didn't mean to sound like, how do I, um, or I should do it. So my other, uh, uh, so I'm only uh, less than a year away from the presidential address that I gave at the American Economic Association. Uh, and I called my presidential address Narrative Economics. Um, so uh, here I uh, picture this. I had to suddenly come up with a presidential address. Not suddenly, I had a year to think about it. Before all of the economists of the United States, I, I'd only get a, an audience of about a thousand, they told me. I did get an audience of about a thousand. So it made me a little nervous to be standing up. In front. And I was trying to say, what, what do I have to say to a collected wisdom of the American economist? So I went back and I read presidential addresses. They're all published in the American Economic Review. Uh, and one thing that surprised me about presidential addresses by economists who have reached the, the presidency of their professional association, they tend to criticize the profession. <laughs> that was a surprising thing. Maybe when you get old, you get uh, a little bit crotchety and you like to point out things that you wouldn't. Uh, and in fact, they did uncharacteristic things like Gerard de Bru who was a French economist with uh, a pure mathematical economist. He said things which I interpreted as a little bit like behavioral economic. So wh why did he do that in his, in his presidential address? Uh, but he did. Uh, so I, took, I thought I should air my com complaints about too much reliance on rational optimizing models. In fact, I wanted to carry it a step further. And I think that a lot of things that people do are really silly because they're based on stories they've heard somewhere. Uh, I call those narratives. Uh, and uh, they don't, they've never, re they don't know if it's right or not. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm being elitist in a different way, but I thought economists just gave people too much credit, generally. Uh, so I was worried that I would be booed out of my presidential address. But in fact, they were all very polite, and nobody said anything. Uh, they clapped at the end. So uh, I'm sure not all of them liked it. But um, 
But this is uh, just not the whole. You can read my president. I think I'm writing a. I will be writing a book expanding on this. Uh, called maybe it will be called narrative economics. So the key idea here is an idea from other social sciences, which I'm trying to import into economics, and that is that narratives matter. So what is a narrative? Uh, uh, well, actually, I have a slide. Maybe I'll move to my. It, or another thing that I emphasize in my talk is that. Economics should change now because of the advent of something called big data. And I'll come back to that. Big data means everything is being digitized. You can collect data a million different ways and form it yourself. You don't have to rely on government national accountants who are calculating gross domestic product. Um, then I want to emphasize epidemic models. And so what I've been reading is medical school literature. There's a small group of medical school professors who do mathematical epidemiology, and they build mathematical models of the spread of diseases. Uh, I think there are beginning, I, it's not just with me, there have been a few others who've started to apply epidemic models to economics. And I want to expand on that and make that a big thing. And it's also a prediction for the future. Uh, economics won't be looking like it did. Uh, it's going to change because of, we've got big data. We can look at epidemics of ideas, not epidemics of diseases, epidemics of narratives, stories that people tell. And that it can explain multipliers and bubbles. And then I, I, I don't know how much I can get through of all this. I have a recent paper with Will Getzman and Dasol Kim on uh, expectations of a stock market crack. And I should have put another bullet point. Uh, I, if I have time, I'll get to my study of the crash of 1987, the stock market crash of October 19th, 1987. But um, I just want to make something about big data. There's a rap, I'm using big data to study big data here. This is, uh, there has been a rapid change in our data environment. And I'm just one little glimpse, I'd like to give you visual images of the change. So this is, uh, a um, uh, ProQuest. ProQuest is, uh, ProQuest is a uh, com um, digitized news service. And I, I'm doing it in the English language. Uh, I just searched for the term big data by decade. No, by year. Uh, the latest year is underreported because it's not done yet. But you can see there's an explosion of uh, newspaper articles. Uh, representing, they use the term big data. And it's just in the last few, uh, le less than a decade. It's a big change and it takes us time to adopt it. So one thing I'm going to be doing is just showing you tantalizing evidence from various di counts of digitized services about how our thinking is changing. Um, so uh, this is just a point that we, 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 we tend to have questionnaire, some people do confidence indexes, and they send out the same questionnaire through time. And I think these are useful. I've been doing it also. But <coughs> uh, big data changes that, because you don't have to rely on questions anymore. But you need a uh, good technique. In other words, I, we can look at newspapers in the past, books in the past. We can go back hundreds of years. They're getting all digitized. But it's not just newspapers and books. I look forward to the day when we can do diaries. So I have a little warning for you. If you keep a personal diary, consider for a moment that it will be digitized someday and it will be being searched over by social scientists or marketers in the future. Because when you die, they'll find your diary and your parents or your children will say, what do we do with this? We'll give it to the digital source and it will be immortalized. Obviously, that's what we should do. So then. People will be searching it. You can already search personal diaries. Also sermons. Also comic books. I haven't seen this. Are they digitalized so I can search them? Uh, I don't know. That, uh, we haven't gotten there yet. But as the years go by, we're going to see more and more big data. Um, so I, I, here's one of my questionnaire surveys, which I've been doing since 1989, supported by Yale School of Management. I ask a question. Uh, Stock prices, now here, I'm asking a question on a survey. 
uh, of, uh, of, I have two different kinds of respondents, individuals who are randomly chosen higher income Americans, and the other one is institutional investors, who professional money managers. So I asked this question, stock prices in the United States when compared with measures of true fundamental value or sensible investment value are too high, too low, or about right? Now, I, I feel a little embarrassed to ask this question because an economist would think this is an ill-phrased question. What does it mean, too high or too low? You could, uh, I, an economist would say, I would suggest you reword this question and ask, uh, what fraction of your portfolio is involved uh, is in the U.S. stock market? And it might be a negative number. We might, if you're shorting the stock market. But in fact, hardly anyone shorts the stock market. They, they couldn't interpret that question about portfolio. They wouldn't know what fraction I have. But they, they respond to a question like this because this is the way they think. We, we pick this question because people respond to it. I'm not quite sure what it means, except you'll discover that just before the, the biggest market correction in recent memory in 2000, uh, that we had a record low. This is percent who think that the market is uh, not uh, too high. So it's confidence. And so they had the lowest confidence uh, in uh, the stock market then. And that went way up with the decline in the market, and it's coming way down now. But this is kind of old-fashioned technique, but I've been, I've been doing it now for 30 years almost. Um, so when we, what I want to try to understand is why do we go through, why, I should have shown the stock market then, but this is, uh, this is the, the stock market, lo the U.S. stock market lost half its value between, 19, uh, between the beginning of 2000 and uh, 2003. So I just want to know what's going on people, through people's minds at these times. Uh, this is narrative economic. What were the stories they were telling? Uh, so I did it for, I've been looking at, uh, uh, well, first of all, the term now is going viral. You, you say that in, how do you say that in Russian? Do you know what I mean? Everyone wants to go viral now on the internet. It means everyone picks up. It, it becomes contagious. Uh, you say that in Russian, right? Uh, uh, what? Uh, Not information. Uh, I want. Uh, do, what do we call them? Memes. You use that word in Russian? Memes. Okay. Uh, what I mean by a meme is something stupid that everyone's repeating. It might be a joke, but it might make you nervous, and it might affect your economic behavior. So I, I just go back to old newspapers and search and try to find out. I'm searching, but I'm doing it in order to read newspapers. Search for terms like, why is the stock market overpriced, or something like that. So I find that just before 1929, uh, there was a lot of attention to broker's loans. They, uh, they changed the meaning of the word, but uh, there, there was a lot of publicity given to the story about these crazy investors who borrow 90% of the money to buy stocks because they think the stock market is going to keep going up. Oh, I have here also, uh, the, I, I, I'm having, well, you know the word meme, then, okay? Uh, uh, how, how old is that? Well, the, the word meme was coined by Richard Dawkins, a UK geneticist, in his book, The Selfish Gene. And he argued that ideas are like genes, the same idea. They, they, they spread, uh, or like viruses, they spread through contagion. But the idea that ideas spread through contagion, I, I traced it as far back as David Hume writing in uh, 1742. Uh, so, uh, but now I think that what has to happen to make the economics profession adopt narrative economics more, we have to be getting semantic search better. So semantic search, now you're familiar, you must search often on the internet one way or another. Uh, the search engines are getting better and better. And they can get better um, if you, they allow you to search for an idea rather than a word. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's what semantic search is. And there's a lot of people doing 
uh, these are terms for uh, systematic ways of analyzing text uh, on the, uh, uh, there's a literature, a computer science literature on this. Uh, words change, it's a certain const so we're living in an era, we have been for the last decades, uh, of uh, GDP as a measure of success of a country. So this is, uh, this is a um, Google n-gram count of the phrase, uh, well, it wasn't gross domestic product, it was gross national product uh, until sometime in the 1950s. Uh, but that's basically almost the same. So uh, before the Great Depression, they didn't even have a measure of economic activity, uh, not, not an aggregate one. And uh, we, we developed government agencies. They, they copied it all over the world. And they compute this number called gross domestic product. But I think we're going to have different numbers. We also have these stock price averages uh, that uh, affect our thinking. Uh, so, for example, you've heard of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, or called just the Dow. Now, it's reported uh, in history books that it was created in 1896. But if I go back to 1896, it's right around here, I don't see anything for the Dow. That's because it was created by some academics, or, well, some newspaper person who was sort of academically in, uh, oriented and wanted to create a, a stock price index. But, but most people didn't have any, couldn't relate to that. Uh, and even in the Great Depression, they were starting to report it, but you can hardly see it. Uh, it really took off and it's gone viral. The word Dow Jones Industrial Act, if you talk to a reporter, they will say, well, that's the traditional value. I don't know who did this or why. He doesn't, they don't realize that they did it, that this uh, tradition was developed through uh, media aping other media people. They don't know what to say, so they choose words that were popular at that time. So this is another example of where big data will go. And this is not my paper. This is a paper by Baker, Bloom, and Davis uh, quite recently. They now have a website uh, where they're using uh, textual analysis to distill an index of economic policy uncertainty. And they, they're using computers to go back over newspapers uh, uh, back to 1900 for the United States and looking at uh, the percent of articles that share that use words that suggest that people are worried that the government might change regulations or taxes in an important way. Uh, and they publish this index, uh, and it's updated on their website. So you see interesting things here that were never measured before. Notably, economic policy uncertainty was highest in the United States uh, just before, or in the late Great Depression. Um, just before well, World War II. Uh, and I think that that has, uh, they're proposing that it has some explanation for the actual Great Depression main, lasting as long as it did. Uh, in other words, the Great Depression was a period of high unemployment worldwide, but especially in places like the United States and Germany uh, that, uh, uh, lasted a whole decade. A popular story in the newspapers from that time was that business people were reluctant to be entrepreneurial and expansive because they didn't know what would happen uh, to economic policy in the United States. They're worried about um, President Roosevelt, who, uh, it's interesting to see, you've heard of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the most leftist president in U.S. history who um, during these years uh, of high uncertainty uh, was tolerating communists or people with communist leanings. He would work with organizations that had affiliations with the Communist Party of the United States. Uh, it was called the Golden Age of American Communism. It was partly a reaction to the Depression, but it left people thinking that a revolution might be coming, but that Roosevelt was only the beginning. That was a narrative of that time. And you can see it in these data. So economists had neglected to read what businessmen were saying in, 18, in, the, in the late 1930s 
because they don't have any. What do we do with that? Okay, some businessman thinks that Roosevelt is making business uncertain because of his leanings towards rapid policy change. Uh, ultimately, then, there was a turn against communism uh, after, <laughs> and uh, the U.S. became more capitalist, and economic policy uncertainty faded. So I'm thinking that some of those strains of thought help explain the Great Depression of the United States, but you wouldn't know that reading Friedman and Schwartz or other uh, economists who tend to talk in kind of mechanical terms about central bank policy and the like. This is another big data analysis of the use of the term narrative by social science. Now I'm going on to another digitized database. It's called JSTOR. JSTOR has academic journals going back generally to their beginnings like 100 years ago. So I did, uh, and you can, you can also search by discipline. Uh, so I searched, this is in my presidential address. Uh, these are social sciences. Uh, and what I have here is the percent of articles that uh, have the word narrative in it. Uh, and uh, 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 you can see that uh, econ uh, finance is the worst field of them all in terms of any appreciation of narratives. That seems odd to me because I think of the stock market as driven by stories. Uh, Every, every stock market crash is a time for a review of the last stock market crash. And they're looking for similarities. They're not thinking like, because most people are not economists. Uh, they're not economists, so we don't expect them to think like us. Um, but you can see the, the disciplines with most attention to narratives are anthropology, history, sociology. The other thing is, this is surprising, every single field shows a rising influence of the word narrative. Every social science, including economics and finance. And I think there's something of a revolution crossing boundaries of social sciences into more of an appreciation of narrative. It partly comes from people like uh, Jerome Bruner, who's a psychologist, who uh, half century, less than half century ago, wrote about the importance of stories in people's lives and made the point that everyone has a personal story, uh, and they identify, who am I? It's very important to know, who am I? What is my distinctive characteristic? Why am I important? Most people think they're important in some way or another. That's normal. Uh, and they have a story. Um, there are also national stories and occupational stories that distinguish groups, but your sense of identity is developed by a story. My co-author, George Akerlof, and Rachel Cranton wrote a book called Identity Economics about 10 years ago, which I recommend. That what people, we, we write down a utility function, that people want to maximize the utility of consumption. But behind that, they really want to maximize who am I and why am I a good person? And all this consumption activity is a means to some other more uh, abstract end. Uh, so now I want to talk about epidemiology. And, uh, some economists know this model, but I think most don't. This is, I think, the most famous model from mathematical epidemiology. And it was published 90 years ago by Kermack and McKendrick. Um, and it's been used by economists. But they tend, like you said, information, <laughs> informatia. <laughs> they tend to apply this to information. But I want to apply it to stories. It, maybe that involves some information. But a narrative is a is a story that is engaging and that uh, it may convey information, but it's selective in the kind of information it, it conveys. It, it can be some useless information. And it, it's a story about maybe what other people are doing. Uh, and uh, so let, let's apply. Uh, the, so I, I want to have a model of memes of thought. I'll give you an example of memes, of a meme, an internet meme. Somebody did a camera uh, did a photo, a video, of their two children. They had like a three-year-old boy and a one-year-old boy. Uh, and the one-year-old boy sticks his finger in the mouth of, of the three-year-old boy, sticks his finger in the mouth of the one-year-old, and the one-year-old bites it. And then the three-year-old says, Daddy, Charlie bit my finger. <laughs> and then after a minute of crying, he then sticks it in again. Why, why would anybody do that? 
uh, it's a stupid internet uh, thing, but it, it, went, it had millions of hits. Uh, why did it? Because it was contagious in a way. So here, I want to apply the uh, contagion model for uh, diseases to something like that. So, but, but let's think medical school for a moment. Now we're talking about influenza or something like that. How does it spread? The, uh, the, the Kermack and McKendrick model is called a compartment model because they divide the population into three compartments. The um, uh, S is the fraction susceptible to the disease, people who have not caught it yet and have no immune protection against it. I is the fraction of the population infected and now contagious, and R is the fraction of the public recovered. And in this model, we assume that ever after you become, after you've experienced the illness, nobody dies in this model. You just become immune, and then you can never be reinfected, and you're not carrying the disease either. So uh, you get that. And now there's two parameters to this model: the contagion rate C and a recovery rate R. Uh, and the, the basic idea of this model is the, uh, an epidemic usually begins from very small beginnings. Uh, I, uh, like one, there's 100 people in an area, and then someone coming from outside the area is the single carrier of the disease. Okay. Um, then what will you expect to see happen? Uh, and we're assuming no changes in contagion rates or recovery rates. So uh, what ends up happening is the susceptibles uh, start getting converted from susceptibles into infected. Uh, at, at, at a rate, uh, C times the product of the number of susceptibles and infected. You have to have a pair of people, one who's infected and one who's susceptible for the disease to spread. Uh, and so the C represents how effective the disease is spreading when two people meet each other. But S times I, well, S times I is the number of susceptibles times the number of infectives, and that's the number of possible meetings. Uh, and then they recover. Uh, so there's, an, there's a tendency, these are the recovered. The re recovered people are always growing, uh, the equal, the equal recovery rate times the number of infectives. Uh, and they have to, the, the three differential equations have to sum to zero because N is fixed. So it's a very simple model. And here's an example where I've got 100 people in the population. One infective is introduced, and I've just picked a couple of parameter values for C and R. Uh, and you can see, I've shown plots of all three, S, I, and R, but concentrate on infected. So these are the people who are showing up at the doctor's office. This is what you see. The doctor's office says, I'm seeing lots of new influenza cases now. This is the epidemic. I, I could have maybe kept the... It might have taken, a, if I had picked a smaller um, uh, I sub zero, like a fraction of a, a thousandth, or so, there would be a tail on this side too, where the disease is growing, but it hasn't reached the level that anyone notices that there's anything abnormal. Then you have this spike, uh, and then the disease epidemic peaks in terms of numbers of infected, and then it starts falling. Why does it fall? It's not because the contagion rate has changed. It's falling because there aren't enough exposures. Uh, the SI is going down because the number of susceptibles is being lowered so that the people are getting over the disease faster than they're spreading it. Uh, yes? So is this going to be like the price of Bitcoin? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, I don't have a plot for the price of Bitcoin, but that Bitcoin is exactly what uh, I, I'm thinking of. Why is Bitcoin so exciting? It, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a narrative. Uh, we were just talking about this uh, with some of us, uh, uh, your faculty. Um, I like to emphasize the power of the narrative. So is there anyone here who hasn't heard of Bitcoin? I, I hate to remember, I shouldn't ask a question like this. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm uh, shaming you, but I bet almost all of you have heard of it. This is a high C over R epidemic, high contagion rate relative to the which means it will infect the whole population, practically the, well, especially among your group, which is kind of intellectual. Uh, uh, and it's, it's powered by a narrative. Uh, and um, so what, what is the narrative? First of all, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I will bet that most of you at this point in your life are thinking, I wish I understood better what Bitcoin is and how it works. <laughs> and so I asked a Bitcoin uh, expert, how, how, uh, for a reading on this. 
uh, I can tell you that there's a website, uh, there's a Princeton University professor of computer science, I forget his name now, who has a course on cryptocurrencies. And uh, I started watching it, and I realized you can't figure out Bitcoin in a half hour. Uh, so you can go, I, I don't remember, you can find it. You can take his course online. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to occupy days of your time. So uh, you have not signaled your, uh, your identity as being part of the Bitcoin community because you haven't wanted to allocate so much time to taking a whole course on something that might be meaningless. And you doubt that it's really that meaningful. But other people do take the course and then they form a sort of camaraderie. We're like a political movement. We understand. And it's actually smart. It's smart in an important way that crypto, uh, cryptography is a science. Uh, how do you maintain security? Uh, and it's, um, th there are smart people in it. Uh, but on the other hand, there are also uh, opportunistic people. And uh, there might be a fatal flaw in Bitcoin, which I suspect. But it doesn't matter for the, uh, the narrative spread. Now, the other thing about Bitcoin is I've noticed that when I talk to people about Bitcoin, they wake up. Uh, I haven't actually noticed anyone here sleeping. So I, <laughs> but not just wake up. I sense there's a sparkle in their eye. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm over. They love Bitcoin. And uh, it, it's just, uh, I, I, I put it to, uh, again, a narrative. This is not standard economic way of thinking. I'm glad you got me onto this because I'm running out of time. <laughs> maybe I didn't motivate my narrative economics well enough. But uh, there's other narratives going around that add to the contagion rate of Bitcoin. And a really important narrative is the narrative of artificial intelligence and robots replacing human beings. And people all over the world, this is universal, everyone has heard of this, and everyone is worried, will I be replaced? So why is Bitcoin so contagious? You take young people today who, they're wondering, what should I be preparing for? Anything I can think of as my job, I might be replaced. And by a robot or a computer, or even if not complacent, I won't be valuable. Like, for example, learning foreign languages, right? You can spend years perfecting that. And you can still beat the computer program, but they're getting better and better and better. And will you have a job as a translator in 10 or 20 years? They're now developing little earphones that you can wear all the time. And people can talk to you in any language. And it will automatically detect the language and translate it. So you become universal. It will all be universal. This is a dream. This is a narrative. But it, they're spreading now. So that, that's exactly, so, uh, exactly the Bitcoin narrative. So it's high C over R, which means it penetrates a high fraction of the population. Um, and it also it, it has certain uh, emotional uh, parts to it that, um, that get uh, people animated about it. It's, it's something that sounds fun. I, I, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, and it has a bubble, a bubble component. It just hit $10,000 per Bitcoin. Um, uh, so oh, this is just the mathematics for the epidemic. This is from Kermack and McKendrick, 1927. But it, it's basically this equation he derived, they derived from the model that I just showed you, the size of the epidemic. Uh, that's our infinity. Um, depends on the ratio of contagion rate to removal rate. But, but the speed of the epidemic depends on, uh, on their levels. So, so the, the bottom line about the, the Kermack and McKendrick model says you can have fast epidemics and slow epidemics. Fast that would come and go in a week, or they can come and go in a century. Uh, and then you can have big epidemics and little epidemics. Big epidemics that everyone, like uh, chicken pox, is a disease that everyone catches as a child, almost everyone as a child. Uh, but there are other diseases that you will probably never catch. But they can go, th they've been going through either a fast or slow epidemic. Uh, so here's another, but this is, again, uh, maybe more relevant to American audiences. But you people must know the Laffer curve, uh, some of you. Uh, I just, this is an example that I did in my presidential address of a, of a narrative epidemic. So here is this, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, to me, it's not the greatest story, 
But I'll tell you one thing, it was a surely contagious story. So in 1976, Jude Waniski, who was a writer for the Wall Street Journal, invited important people to lunch. He got the vice president, or the future vice president of the United States, Dick Cheney, and the defense secretary for the United States, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, to come to a fancy restaurant in Washington, D.C. and bring an economist. That was Art Laffer. Uh, and uh, I'm telling you a story. Why am I telling you these details? Because the details matter for the contagion of the story. So the story is Art Laffer, who is a right-wing, lower-tax type economist, uh, pulled out a napkin at the restaurant and drew this curve on the napkin. And, uh, uh, and so what it is is a, uh, uh, th this isn't exactly his uh, diagram. I mean, it is his diagram. I just redid it here. Uh, but we have on this axis the tax rate on income from 0 to 100. And on this axis, we have government revenues. Uh, and he said, how do revenues depend on the tax rate? Uh, here he's explaining this to two non-economists, the Secretary of Defense and the Vice President. Uh, he said, well, if I have a 0% tax rate, I'll get zero revenue, obviously. If I have a 100% tax rate, I'll get zero revenue because nobody's going to work if I give it all to, if I have to give it all to the government. Uh, in between, you can collect, uh, you can, uh, collect some revenue. So suppose I have to collect 1,000 as my government revenue. What tax rate do I need to charge? And lo and behold, there's always two tax rates for any amount of government expense. That's the punchline. It's like a joke. Isn't it kind of clever? It gets right to the point. Uh, he's suggesting without any evidence that the US government was at point A rather than point B. And all we have to do is cut taxes from 90% to 10%, and we'll have the same revenue. This is like a joke. It spreads like a joke, but it's a little bit of an intellectual joke. Maybe you can't tell this to everyone, but it, it certainly has contagion in a certain part of the population. So he wrote, Jude Waniski, a professional business writer, wrote this up in his uh, book, uh, which was a bestseller. And this was the key thing from his book that everyone seems to remember. Why is it so remembered? Uh, well, anyway, th there, there's a... Uh, there's the Amer American Museum, see, the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., called Art Laffer up and asked him, do you still have the napkin? Do we want to add it to our per permanent exhibition at the museum? And Art Laffer said to them, reportedly, what napkin? And they said, well, the napkin that's described in the book. He didn't remember anything about this lunch. And then he said, that was a fancy restaurant, and they had cloth napkins. I would never have done that. My mother taught me not to write on someone's cloth napkins. So then they called Jude Waniski, and he said, I have it. I'll give it. And you can see it. You can search for it on the museum website. Uh, how did he get it if Blaffer didn't remember doing it? Uh, that's a mystery. But anyway, it's in the museum exhibit. Why did that thing matter? It's because the narrative had a certain poignancy uh, I wouldn't have guessed it. I'm not Art, uh, Jude Waniski. I'm not a professional writer. But somehow, I'm, it, I, I don't know how it, it's, it spread differently in different countries. Uh, Le Courbe La Faire in France uh, had an epidemic too, but much weaker. Uh, after this thing was published, Margaret Thatcher was elected right-wing prime minister of UK. Ronald Reagan was put as right-wing president um, President of the United States, and Francois Mitterrand was the first socialist president of France. So Laffer Curve didn't penetrate France. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone here from France to tell me why this story I just told you just doesn't impress French people, but somehow it didn't. Um, so um, this is Laffer Curve counts in, in, in books in, in, in the English language, uh, starting from uh, the publication of uh, Winiski's book. And it, it forms a curve somewhat like the uh, curve I showed uh, for infectives. Uh, I'm running out of time. I won't be able to get through all of the things I... If you go back in history, you find that they have words and things that change through time. Uh, I, I look for the word profiteer. Do you know that it, it's an English language where a profiteer is a company that is making too much profits, okay? 
So economists don't like words like that. It had an epidemic in the 1920s. And if you go back and read about profiteers, uh, people were doing boycotts of high profit companies out of anger. So some, some sort of narrative spread and caused a short depression. It, it was short lived, so this was a quick epidemic. Uh, stock market crash, I mentioned this before. There were only two occasions when we had stock market crashes that were so called by the newspapers 1929 and 1987. Uh, so, uh, there, and there are two fast epidemics, I would say. Uh, of attention to a crash, but they didn't fade away completely because uh, this is Great Depression. Again, I'm searching both, I didn't say this very fast, but very accurate. We have both books and newspapers shown here. But Great Depression started, the, it started here, you can see that, in 1933 or 34 with the publication of uh, Lionel Robbins' book entitled The Great Depression. The same year, by the way, that uh, Johannes Steele published a book called The Second World War, 1934. He predicted it five years before it began. Uh, but it didn't become, neither of these terms became viral at that time. They've, they've, they're growing in a slow epidemic. And then we had this tremendous peak in enthusiasm for the term Great Depression in the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. So I think the, the financial crisis can be explained largely as a narrative. Uh, based on 1929, uh, that people thought 1929 is coming again, their banks are going to fail again, it's the same thing. And so they stopped spending, and that created the financial crisis. Um, so uh, this is economic theories. Economic theories come and go according to the same Kermack and McKendrick model. Uh, they tend to become famous 15, 20 years after they're published. This is a, a dilemma for young people who want to get a job, uh, nothing that you can do will be f famous, really famous, until 20 years goes by, and then it will be too late for you. Uh, Albert Einstein had to uh, take a job in a patent office because uh, his theories weren't. Uh, uh, but uh, I've asked both individual and institutional investors, what do you think is the probability of a catastrophic stock market crash in the United States? Like, the, the two of them, there's only exactly two of them, 1929 or 1987. Uh, and I, re, I, I compute the average probability uh, that they give of a crash. Uh, and this is the average probability of a crash. It's in my paper with Getzman and Kim. Uh, it's high. Uh, there's only been two crashes in US history. So the probability in six months is like one in 200. Uh, but they give something like, you can't read this, but between 15 and 25 percent. So people exaggerate. That's because they, they have a narrative about that 1929. I think they're forgetting 1987, but the 1929 narrative is still going. And we try to explain what determines uh, the crash. Uh, and uh, newspaper stories about, about previous stock market movements seem to be the big thing that generates them. But the other thing that we did is we found that uh, we had questionnaires with both the postal code uh, and, and the date uh, uh, entered on them. So we knew exactly where they were and when they filled out the questionnaire. And we found that if there was an earthquake within 30 miles in 30 days, they gave a higher probability of a stock market crash. This is interregional. So why would earthquakes make you, uh, an earthquake in your area, make you fear of a stock market crash? Well, our theory is it's something called the affect heuristic that Paul Slovic and other psychologists have talked about. When something shakes you up, you don't have earthquakes in Moscow, do you? But imagine that suddenly this room started trembling and you, you had to duck under the desk or something. When you got up, you were more worried about everything for a while. This is the way the human brain works. Uh, this has zip code fix uh, Do we have zip code fix effects? Uh, so, uh, okay, but uh, we can't exactly do a zip code because we don't have two of the same. They're hardly ever. These are small areas. Uh, let me think about that. Uh, uh, 
So let me just uh, let me just quickly say, let's go back to no October 19th, 1987. This is the biggest one-day drop in stock markets in world history. Uh, Black Monday, which is a rehearsal of it. We were talking about this uh, earlier. Black days. Uh, uh, the, uh, they, they renamed things using old names to make this. Newspaper people try to embellish stories and make them go viral. That's how you make your pay grade in the newspaper. You go viral. So they called it Black Monday based on what happened in 1929. Uh, and this was the biggest one-day stock market crash ever. There it is. Uh, uh, this is every day since 1928. And you can see the percentage change in stock price. There you can see it's the biggest outlier event. And I won't, uh, I'm running out of time. It was partly stories about portfolio insurance, a narrative. But it was also this picture, which appeared. Uh, I noticed that nobody else points this out. But I keep, new, I keep old newspapers from around event dates. And I was just browsing through the Wall Street Journal. And I saw this on page 15. But this is the very morning of the October 19th, 1987 crash. And it has up here, it has the stock market up until October the previous day uh, in the United States. And here's the, the stock market from 1922 to 1929. <coughs> so here it is. You are a stock market trade. You're already shaken by big price declines the preceding week. And then they show this in the morning newspaper as you're getting up to go to work on October 19, 1987. Uh, it kind of brings the, it, it also conveys to you that everybody else is considering the possibility that this is 1929 again. Uh, because you know everyone else is reading this paper. So when prices start falling on October 19, 1987, you have to make a decision. Am I going to jump and get out? Why should I do that? Everyone's telling me don't overreact. But look, this could be 1920. Other people are thinking it could be 1929 again. So. Um, uh, that's an example of a narrative being promoted by a, a, a news agency uh, and having a tremendous impact, even though I, I, you know, it was only on page 15. Uh, but you know, people do look at page 15, especially when they've been worrying all weekend because the, there were record stock price drops the preceding few days. So it puts together like a perfect storm. Uh, that explains these big events. And then this thing uh, becomes legendary for a while, depending on the quality of this story. But this story wasn't as good as 1929, so it's fading away. And 1929 is winning. So I'll stop with that and see if there are any. Uh... Can I in for a second? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bob uh, possibly didn't pay attention that we are celebrating 25 oh, years yeah. of the New Economic School, but this was uh, when I was talking in the first part of his, of his lecture about 25 years between then and now, I was thinking whether the New Economic School impacted the attitudes of Russian and Americans for 25 years, so that's still an open question, but thank you for asking that. Oh. Now, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have that much time for the questions, and the reason is that uh, even though Professor Schiller is a guest of our institution, it was under condition that we return safe and unharmed <laughs> to certain place in Moscow by certain time. So it's very hard and uh, difficult budget constraint, time constraint. So we have 15 minutes for questions, so please, please try to do it within. Some of the questions should be short, therefore. I still waiting for this. Yeah. Doug, go ahead, Doug. Uh, Meg, um, thank you. Oh, yeah, very interesting talk, thank you very much. Uh, so I guess now uh, you're bullish on uh, Russian stocks and not US stocks. I was on a TV show in the United States, and uh, I was argu arguing that the US is overpriced, and uh, compared, like the most pricey stock market in the world. And so they asked me, uh, the reporter asked, what's the, the least pricey market in the world. Well, I happen to notice that Berkeley's Bank has a website that does CAPE rate. That's another of my ratios. Uh, it's price divided by 10-year average earning. 
And they have 26 countries shown. And Russia was the lowest of 26 countries. Uh, and I thought, so, uh, and so then the report, I pointed that out and I said, maybe, uh, what is it? And then he pressed me. He said, so are you advising re uh, re investing in Russia? <laughs> and I was unprepared for the question. Uh, I said, well, of course you should invest in Russia because uh, at least that's part of a diversified portfolio. And as, as the United States goes up in its stock market, conventional finance theory says you should be rebalancing. So you should be taking money out of the US and into Russia. I felt uncomfortable saying that, though, um, because it sounds unpatriotic. Uh, and there's strained, and strained relations between US and Russia now, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, and, uh, but I did say it. So yeah, I think one should invest Russia. Uh, I'm coming around to actually saying that. Uh, because uh, what, what goes up as the U.S. head will go down, and what goes down will come up. Uh, not always, <laughs> on average. That's based on a, a generous interpretation of narrative theory. And you can look at U.S.-Russian relations, and immediately it comes into mind the different narratives, and they're profoundly different. Uh, and it's not very factual. That most people don't really think about what's going on. Uh, uh, yeah. Or unless there's some student, and, I mean, but uh, so what I was thinking was, could there be some scope for using these contagion models with, for example, technical analysis? So different patterns of, are fairly fashionable. Uh, by the way, uh, that's happening. The big data has hit the investment industry big time, but they generally don't want to tell you their research results. It used to be, for 25 years, I ran with Dick Thaler a behavioral finance workshop at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And it always used to puzzle me why we weren't rich. Um, uh, I wasn't rich. I wasn't doing anything like that. And neither were, there were only a few. Like Dick Thaler uh, had founded a firm, Fuller Thaler Associates. Uh, and uh, there were a few others. Now they're all rich. <laughs> These guys, as far as I know, maybe I don't know that. We had Andre Schleifer, who has uh, uh, a firm, at, uh, and we had Joseph Lekanishak. Uh, uh, so, uh, but now it's happening. I think behavioral finance is out. And uh, I'm, I'm reading about it in newspapers, that there are more and more uh, technical analysis with high-powered computers looking, and they're, they're scouring text. But I, I think, though, that they may, uh, uh, they may be too mechanical. That's my guess. Uh, what I'm trying to advocate is uh, it's kind of a, um, a broader uh, social science that involves reading history. Uh, you can't just count things and expect to be, well, maybe you can, but I mean, I think it's even better if, I was emphasizing at the beginning that words change and meanings change. And at this point, we're still not in a place where the semantic search is good enough that it can really identify a human idea. But you can use it as a help to identify a human idea. So, so when I talked about profiteer, that was a new word. It was coined in 1912, according to Oxford English Dictionary. That word didn't exist until 1912. Then it had this epidemic curve upward peaked in 1921, and then started to decline. But I wasn't satisfied with that. I go back and read the newspapers. And so uh, in the United States, there was trouble about the depression of 1920-21, and there was anger at the business people. But at the same time, they didn't want to be communist. There was a strong anti-communist th uh, threat at that time. So they just had to have their own language, their own way of describing what they were angry about. I'm not even sure what it was. Something, it's the same thing that bothered other people who became communists, but they had to have an American look to it or something different. And they invented that word and picked it up. But it, it, searching for that word today doesn't mean much anymore. It doesn't have any special significance. So it takes human judgment. Uh, so one thing we can do is learn from other disciplines and learning from history. Uh, good historians, uh, Think, they read what people were saying and think about what they were thinking. Yeah. 
thank you for the talk and thank you for being contagious. For being contagious. <laughs> So you talked about narratives, and I think that there is a dichotomy between personal narrative and social narrative. So for but example... Do you all hear him? Social versus personal narrative. Yeah, so like when I choose which research topic I would like to go in, uh, it's, you can be considered a personal choice. But when I start to research, I, well, for sure I address the social narrative, how other researchers deal with this problem and stuff like that. Could you elaborate? bit about the relationship between personal and social narrative? Well, I think that uh, the personal narrative is something that appeals to you intrinsically. So you might think that you want to do, uh, you're young Albert Einstein, <laughs> i use that as an example again, and you, you think that modern physics is really screwed up. There, there's, some, there's some anomalies like the Michelson-Morley experiment that just can't be reconciled, and why aren't physicists thinking about this? But when you try it out on your, um, your mentors at Zurich Polytechnic, they just don't respond. They're not, they think it's nutty or they don't, uh, they're too busy. So uh, what you have to do, what Einstein did, is make it, um, well, what he, I guess he had to do was wait and live patiently for a time when he could get attention. Watch the, his narrative explode. But there's a tendency for people, I think it's a mistake for young people in research, that's a common mistake that young people make, is to think that I have to do something that fits in to the existing paradigm, when it's exactly the opposite. You might not get a job right out, but you shouldn't be letting that uh, cloud your thinking. But uh, we have lots of opportunist people who try to latch on to a social narrative, and I, I guess to some extent maybe you have to do that, but you don't want to go too far. So you have to, uh, this is my advice, <laughs> Uh, you have to, uh, I've, something that I thought I, I learned as years go by, more and more, that people who do things that, uh, that are intelligent expansions of their personal narrative, as you say, are, are more likely to be successful in the long run. Uh, Doug, yeah. yeah. economies haven't collapsed. Also, in the later the Great Depression, the, the U.S. economy is actually growing faster in that period than it's ever grown at any other period. Uh, in I'm sorry, you're saying the U.S. economy grew during the Great Depression? After 1933, the U.S. economy is growing faster than it's grown. From the bottom of 33. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but then, and then also in 39 to 41, that's when actually economic policy uncertainty was very high again, but actually the economy was growing very fast. 39 to 41, that's just before World War II. Uh, well, the, the, one thing I was not doing here was prevent, presenting a completed analysis. This was more like a presidential address, hoping that economists will be more mindful of important factors and thinking that, um, that uh, we, we have to understand what people value and what's, what is important to them. And economists don't like to tell stories. They don't like to re, uh, uh, it's kind of against the grain of our culture. Uh, there's also a difference between newspaper journalism, uh, which are ready to jump on stories and tell them all the time. And we, f we have a tendency to feel uh, condescending to them. Uh, to some extent, we ought to be, because they're making things go viral that maybe shouldn't. Uh, on the other hand, I think we can't really have a, a deep appreciation of history. Or we can't do things like predict the next crisis. So I, I get involved now, are we going to have a stock market crash? Uh, and I'm looking in the United States at the very high valuations. Uh, I'm w mindful of the fact that people are uniformly horrible at predicting these things, uh, or predicting depressions. Uh, the uh, de depressions, major depressions we have were just essentially unpredicted. So I'm thinking that maybe uh, Maybe one can do better in understanding the origins of these things if one studies. Uh, it's closer to reality in my mind. That doesn't mean that it will be easy to ever to forecast the stock market because once you, once you develop it and other people know your forecast, it will change the way it works. 
but it'd probably be a change for the better. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо. Oh, 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 очень очень хорошо. И мы очень надеемся, что он приедет в следующий раз, правильно? His, his previous visit here was in 2008. Now it took nine years, so I hope it will not take as long to come again. Благодарю вас из всех сердца. Нет, 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 точно прав.